Kyle, would love your reaction to this news and what implications do you think it has for 2024? Look, I think when Colorado handed down his decision, we all sort of thought that the U.S. Supreme Court would eventually have to decide this. You also had the Secretary of State in uh, in Maine determining that, that you know that, that Trump could be on the, the primary ballot there. But those decisions were you know basically stayed in, in anticipation of the U.S. Supreme Court having to get involved. And uh, you know, look, I, I I usually sometimes just look at the politics of this, and you know, we know that the U.S. Supreme Court is. Uh, is you know dominated by Republican appointees at this point, including three made by former President Trump. I sort of find it hard to believe that a court like this would um, would, would find against the former president in, in this instance. I mean, even if you look at Colorado, um, you know that's a that's a court that had you know seven uh, Democratic appointees on it. It was a four three decision, and you've seen that Democrats I think have sort of been more divided on this issue than certainly Republican elected. Uh, officials have been, you know, you've got uh, California determined that Trump could be on the ballot. You know, Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat who, of course, is no fan of Donald Trump, has said that, you know, that Trump should be on the ballot. So, again, it's not like there's even unity on the Democratic side on this on this particular issue. And, I, you know, I do think that the politics of that may, may play some role in how the court decides here. Yeah, it's a very good point, but I'd like to zero in on the Republican side and how Trump voters perhaps are receiving news of each and every uh, legal development and still deciding that they are, at the end of the day, Trump supporters. I actually spoke with Frank Lutz, a pollster who uh, you may be familiar with about this yesterday. Just take a listen, if you will, to what he told me. They can't wait to vote for Trump. In terms of the Trump voter, it's not a vote against, it's a vote for him because of the things that he is against. So it's a very negative candidacy, but it is a popular candidacy, and the level of intensity is so, so great. And for the other Republicans, their vote is not as strong. It's not as passionate. So, Kyle, A, is that true? And B, if it is, does anyone else, even someone like Nikki Haley with momentum and another $24 million raised in the fourth quarter, stand a chance? Uh, look, I think he's right about that. I mean, I think there's, there's, you know, Trump has certainly had a passionate following. And look, I mean, over the course of the the calendar year and now into 2024, we have seen all these legal problems for Trump bubble up, and they haven't heard him in a, in, a, in a primary sense on the Republican side. Arguably, even haven't haven't even heard him in a general election sense, given that given that the polling, uh, his polling against Biden has really been pretty decent lately. Although I don't think it's necessarily determinative, and I don't necessarily know if it's taking all of Trump's potential weaknesses in, into account. But regardless, if you're Trump, you can't look at what the numbers have said over the past year and say these legal problems have really impacted him in any way. And, and you know, I do, of course, want to see Iowa actually vote. You know, all we've had is polls. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to see how the, the, the voters actually respond here. But all indications are is that Trump is heavily favored in Iowa. You know, maybe Haley could catch him in New Hampshire. There's been some polling evidence that she's catching up, although Trump is still ahead. Um, and even if Haley were to win New Hampshire, the New Hampshire electorate is, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be composed of more independents and Democrats than you see in most other states. It's a more moderate electorate. Uh, I, I don't even think Haley winning in New Hampshire would necessarily um, derail Trump. I think that he'd have to suffer losses, multiple losses before Super Tuesday for this thing to really get competitive. You know, maybe that'll happen. Maybe we've got a surprise coming here, but I don't see how you can look at the numbers and determine anything other than that. You know, Trump is a big favorite still on the for the GOP nomination. Well, Kyle, you mentioned Nikki Haley specifically in, in New Hampshire, where she has gained a, a lot of ground. And as I mentioned, she has also gained a good deal more money over the course of the last several months, according to the figures from her campaign. Have her odds of being able to pull something like that off in New Hampshire gone down after her comments around the Civil War and her failure to mention slavery as a cause of it? I'd say too soon to tell. One, one way we look at that is whether um, Chris Christie, who is arguably positioned is he sort of even more of kind of an anti-non-Trump candidate than, than Haley is? You know, does Christie pick up some steam? Uh, does the, the, the Haley sort of uh, bu bubble kind of kind of burst a little bit? We don't really have updated numbers to determine whether that, that has happened or not. You know, Christie still being in the race is a big problem for Haley in New Hampshire because – Presumably, the Christie voters, if they didn't have the option to vote for Christie, might go to Haley, but he's still in the race. And maybe some of those kinds of voters, particularly Democrats and independents, um, are sort of turned off by what Haley said. And, you know, maybe they're likelier to, to look at Christie as an alternative. And any sort of splintered vote amongst the kind of more moderate and uh, you know, independent leaning voters on, on the, in New Hampshire, that's all good for Trump, I think. 
Okay, so Kyle, if we look at the numbers and they suggest that Trump is going to be eventually the Republican nominee and unless something unforeseen happens, Biden will be the Democratic nominee. Theory, that's just option A, option B. But there are also option Cs potentially out there, potentially disruptive third-party candidates. What about someone like RFK Jr., who was just granted access, the ability to be on the ballot in Utah today? Uh, you know, there's there is an appetite out there for third party candidates, given that, you know, both Trump and Biden have underwater favorability. It's kind of similar to 2016 in the Trump versus Clinton race in that regard. Um, in that election, six percent of the electorate uh, voted voted third party, although that also means that 94 percent of the electorate voted for either uh, the Democratic or the Republican nominee. Uh, I do think you'll probably see at least mm -hmm. some support go to these third party candidates, although it's also worth noting that polls often overstate the kind of level of support they're going to get. Um, you know, but but that those, you know, depending on how much support those candidates get and where they actually are on the ballot and who's actually running, which we don't quite know yet. Um, those are all the important factors in, in this race between Trump and Biden, which, um, if it in fact materializes, looks like it's going to be another you know, close to competitive election.